Hello and welcome to On Geopolitics, the podcast that looks at geopolitics in a historical context with myself, Ali Ansari, and my partner in crime, Suzanne Rain. Today, we're going to be talking about the continuing crisis in Ukraine in a wider geopolitical context. And it gives me very great pleasure to welcome back an old friend of the show, Professor Bill Hurst, who's Deputy Director of the Centre of Geopolitics at Cambridge. It's good to have you back, Bill. All right, thanks. It's great to be back. And Bill, last time you and I were talking, we were talking about the Beijing Olympics. And I'm going to start by taking us back to the 4th of February, the opening ceremony of the Olympics. And that afternoon, President Putin arrived in Beijing. To fit with the Russian leader's tight schedule, President Xi met him at the state guest house instead of meeting him like all the other guests at the Great Hall of the People. And they talked and they had a dinner. And then they went to the open cere- opening ceremony. And then shortly afterwards, Putin left the country. He didn't attend the next day's banquet, at which President Xi toasted all the foreign dignitaries. And what came out of that weird, quirky half-day meeting and opening ceremony was the joint statement in which the two sides expressed their, their strong solidarity with each other. And, and I wanted to start really by reading one quote from it, which was, the two sides stand against attempts by external forces to undermine security and stability in their common adjacent regions and intend to counter influence by outside forces in the internal affairs of sovereign countries under any pretext, pose colour revolutions and will increase cooperation in the aforementioned areas. So my first question to you, Bill, is did President Xi know what he was signing up for? Well, I think he had an idea of what was being signed up to, and I don't know if it's actually the same idea that Putin had or not. When that happened, I thought, for example, that Putin left the country so quickly and didn't attend a big banquet or a big ceremony in large part because of COVID paranoia. Right. Putin is famously very, very cautious about COVID, probably doesn't want to be in a room with you know, 500 other people uh, if he could avoid it. So it didn't immediately strike me as suspicious in that sense. The other thing about this declaration, the principles that it affirms are actually the same basic principles that underline the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, and so it's not strange for them to be saying this. The reason I think it's strange in the context of Ukraine is that bit about we don't want to support or we want to oppose interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states. Ukraine is recognized by most countries in the world as a sovereign state, and Russia would appear to be interfering pretty substantially in its internal affairs. There's loads of other bits in it where, you know, just reading it now, we have strong mutual support of the protection of core interests, state sovereignty, territorial integrity, oppose interference by external forces and in their internal there's there's a whole load of stuff there which is very ambiguous isn't it because it depends essentially on whether you agree that ukraine is a sovereign country or or not and that that's the bit where you know clearly in terms of interpreting the chinese position from the outset i suppose a a kind analysis would say president xi and and putin both exactly as you said i mean he, there's nothing in this that he disagrees with but if you'd written and in two weeks' time, I'm going to invade Ukraine and cause all sorts of ructions. <laughs> the argument is, I think, that President Xi probably wouldn't have signed that, but maybe you disagree. Well, certainly not publicly. I mean, there, there's been lots of speculation about, you know, did China know that Russia was planning to invade Ukraine? I don't know, one way or the other. I doubt it, actually. I don't think they were informed in advance. I'd be surprised, but I, I have no way of knowing. I think China is in a very difficult position when it comes to Russia's behavior in Ukraine. China wants to support Russia generally uh, in international politics right now because Russia is an important counterweight to NATO and the U.S. and sort of the West generally. China also has a very important security relationship with Russia uh, in terms of licensing of military hardware and technology, in terms of cooperation in other areas, as well as in terms of uh, natural resource import. Uh, from Russia. And of course, as I alluded to, this this Shanghai Cooperation Organization and security, uh, multilateral security arrangements in Central Asia. Uh, So 
you know, in all these ways, China wants to support Russia, but at the same time, what Russia is doing makes it hard for China to offer that support. Right? China has a security guarantee that it offered to Ukraine, I believe, the early 1990s, I think it was 1994. Uh, and then it also signed a treaty of friendship with Ukraine, which it does very seldom with most countries in 2013, and is a major trading partner of Ukraine. And in fact, Russia's pretext for going into Ukraine was really problematic because what they said was that the separatist provinces should be recognized as a sovereign state and that they were going in to defend the integrity of those of that sovereign state. I mean, China's got its own separatist province in Taiwan, which it would be very problematic if another country said, oh, we were going to defend the integrity of that, of Taiwan as a sovereign state, because it's not recognized as such by anybody. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult position that China's in, given what Russia is doing. And I don't think China would ever publicly support Russia. Although in the early days, there were some leaked government documents party documents actually uh, on, on media censorship that directed the, the media in China not to criticize Russia or to support Ukraine. So, you know, there, there's a real ambivalence, I think, about should Russia be criticized? Should Russia be supported? How do you walk this line in between? They're trying very hard to stay exactly in that middle line, but I think it's difficult to do so. Bill, you, you, I mean, you get the impression that if Russia had been much more successful and much quicker in it in, in achieving its aims, that perhaps China might have then sort of come in in, in support. But what's happened is that it, uh, Russia's uh, poor performance uh, so far has really caused China a lot of problems. I mean, would, would that be a fair assessment? Well, I think if Russia had been very quickly successful in Ukraine, it would have sort of obviated the problem for yeah. China because they wouldn't have to support Russia. Russia wouldn't need China's yeah. support uh, in any public way. It would be basically just a fait accompli on the ground. And it would also then imply that NATO would be weakened, Ukraine would be seriously undermined and weakened. You know, the, the, the whole coalition of states that, that has come together quite strongly to defend Ukraine and oppose Russia would be much diminished in importance and strength. And then, you know, that would not necessarily be contrary to China's interests. Uh, and so supporting Russia would have less of a, of a blowback. But I, don't, I just don't think they would have had to support Russia at all. It would be done. Is it fair to say that they, I mean, I, I, I take your point about the sort of rigorous neutrality, which actually is a sort of a, it, it's the right option for them in many ways. You know, they can sort of stay out of it, but they're not also condemning, I suppose, the Russian invasion of Ukraine either. So that's, you know, in that sense, they're maintaining a neutrality. But I mean, would you agree in a sense that they do share a certain worldview with Russia in terms of their relationship with the West? Or is that too harsh, really, on China? That's a really interesting one, because I, I, I hesitate to characterize Russia's worldview, because I don't know it so well. But I think if we take Putin to be somebody who essentially doesn't believe in any kind of international institutions or coalitions, you know, who has a sort of hardline realist view of the world, mm. uh, and sees Russia as playing from a weak position and needing to do its best in the face of a really severe security dilemma, from a position of weakness. China's position historically has been a bit different, which is that, you know, China's looking at the world and saying early on, you know, prior to the 1970s or so, we don't like the system, we're just going to break it as much as possible. But since the 70s, China kind of signed up and said, there are all these institutions, they don't really work ideally from our perspective, but let's live with them and just try to gain some strength within those institutions or sort of under the radar of the institutions. And then more recently, over about the last 10 years, has been really making a strong effort to do two things that I don't think Russia is doing. One is to garner a stronger role for itself within the existing institutions, for example, at WTO or, or in the UN or in any number of other institutions, basically start playing a more prominent uh, role in reshaping aspects of rules that better suit China's priorities. The other thing China's been doing is trying to create rival institutions or alternative institutions, right? whether that's the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank uh, or other kinds of you know, international aid and lending frameworks that sort of exist alongside of what's already there. 
I'm not sure that Russia is doing either of those things. I think Russia may be further along the path of giving up on international institutions or norms or, or coalitions. It's not obvious that China is ready to do that yet. But I think Russia is a critical country for China. It's got a tremendous land border and a fraught long-term relationship in many respects. But it's also important in that Russia can be a counterweight in very important ways to the dominance of existing institutions by the European Union, the United States, NATO, etc. Bill, can I ask, again, I, I'm re- I've been reading the, the joint statement a lot. And that point that you've just made is really interesting because, again, if, if you read the joint statement with that thought in mind about the fact that China does see a role for itself in an international architecture, and it's just that it wants it to be an international architecture that's not controlled by America. Part of the statement here says to protect the UN-driven international architecture and the international law-based world order, to seek genuine multipolarity with the United Nations and its Security Council playing a central and coordinating role, promote more democratic international relations, oddly, given what's just happened in Ukraine, and ensure peace, stability and sustainable development across the world. So, so that illustrates really neatly the point that you've just been making. And then I was going to cut immediately to a little clip. I'm I'm going to speak it as though I'm Liz Truss, the British Foreign Secretary, who gave a speech uh, last week about this, where she says Beijing has not condemned Russian aggression or its war crimes. Russian exports to China rose by almost a third in the first quarter of this year. They've sought to coerce Lithuania. They're commentating on who should or shouldn't be a member of NATO, and they're rapidly building a military capable of projecting power deep into areas of European strategic interest. So those two things basically obviously are at odds. And I think what you're saying is, I think they're reconcilable in that China wants an international system with a structure that it feels fits it. The question then is about China's role in enabling Russia now, because that growth in economic time, I mean, I don't know whether, I don't know what's behind those statistics and whether that's that's something where China is taking up the slack somehow. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting in the in the segment of the joint statement that you just read, which I hadn't read actually, is that that line about seeking robust multipolarity or genuine multipolarity. Mm. I think that's interesting to see so plainly and clearly in a public statement. But that has been I think the the consensus view among policymakers and experts in China for a long time that the world is headed towards multipolarity and that that's a good thing and that that's actually the more stable and peaceful order is one of multipolarity. Now, that's rather different, obviously, from what the consensus view has been in much of the rest of the world, notably in most Western countries, which have long said that either some kind of unipolar hegemony which is what the U.S. has wanted since the end of the Cold War, or a bipolar competition like the Cold War is more stable than a multipolar world, right? So if you talk to experts in the U.S. or in most of Europe, they're going to say, you know, multipolar world is inherently dangerous and unstable, right? And that this is not where things should be headed. The whole Cold War was engineered to, to deal with a bipolar competition that was actually fairly stable, mm even though it was tense and not very productive in some respects. And a unipolar hegemony under the U.S. and in the, in the current iteration is, is desirable above all else. So I think there's that fundamental difference there uh, between worldviews, as it were, not so much in terms of just what the countries want, but in terms of what they see as likely and beneficial. And within that multipolar world that China sees, Russia is always one of the poles. Right? So it's debatable exactly who the poles are, within the multipolar world, not as in who are the people from Poland, but, um, <laughs> you know, who, who are the, the different poles in this, in this multipolar world? China is clearly one. Russia is clearly one. The U.S. is clearly one. Usually, as it's conceived, Japan is clearly one. India might be also, and then maybe some others, depending. So it's, it's important that Russia have a strong global role in order to ensure this multipolar world. Um, and I think that's that's what this statement is is alluding to, and I think that that may be where Russia and China's interests align uh, in the sort of very broad sense. But does Russia invading Ukraine help it to be an international power or great power or a pole among multiple poles in, in this new world order? That's much less obvious to me. 
Well, I mean, let me throw something else into the mix just to make us worry a bit more. I noticed that I, I think the Chinese, I, I don't know if he's the chief of staff or the head of the army or whatever. I mean, he, he just recently paid a visit to Iran. And I, I would say from the Iranian perspective, by the way, they definitely think they are one of the uh, new centers uh, of this multipolar world. And they would certainly see themselves as uh, as part of sort of civilizational, shall we say, structure with um, with China. Uh, with Russia, definitely. I mean, they're obviously already collaborating with Russia and Syria, you know, and other parts, uh, and and probably India. And it's quite striking to see actually some of the sort of ideological synergies that that come out. Now, I take your point that I think the Chinese are playing a much more subtle game in that sense, but the Russians and the Iranians aren't. I mean, they're, they're much blunter actually in what they think uh, the future is going to look like, and it's a future in which the West is in decline, and that these, you know, these civilizational powers will be taking basically charge i i'm you know i'm interested in that sort of chinese uh, link because obviously the iranians signed this great memorandum of understanding or some of this great sort of uh, agreement with the chinese about a year ago mm. which the iranians made a big deal of i don't think the chinese did i don't think the chinese were that serious about it but the iranians were made a big deal out of it they're obviously signing up for the shanghai corporation organized although as an observer i think i mean i don't think they're fully part of it and they've just recently signed a similar sort of twenty-five year agreement with the Russians. So, I mean, I was it, quite interesting to see. You know, I think in terms of the world view, it's perhaps a little bit more explicit or explicitly expressed. You know, from the the Russian Iranian perspective than it might be from the Chinese. But the Chinese are clearly, I, I think, that really the pivot. I mean, without the Chinese, I don't think it really it wouldn't really work at all. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it, I just wonder in some ways whether the Chinese are being more opaque, perhaps cleverly opaque, but but actually are signing up to a sort of a, a very sort of anti-Western position. Again, I don't know how realistic that is, given Chinese relations with the United States anyway, certainly economic ties. Well, and beyond the United States, countries like South Korea, Japan, lots and lots of countries, mm-hmm. Australia, that China has strong economic relationships right. with, although increasingly fraught security relationships in all of those cases as well. No, I think that the situation from China's point of view with Iran is really important because Iran is an essential partner for China in the energy sphere as well as in looking at Central Asia and trying to come up with an architecture that works for Central Asia, where Russia is not going to dominate completely, where the U.S. and Turkey especially are sort of pushed to one side uh, as much as possible, and, and the region doesn't explode. Uh, in any kind of massive conflict. that That's sort of what China's hoping for. And I think that there's a consensus in China for a long time that Iran is an important part of that and can be very helpful and useful in building that from China's point of view. The aspect of, you know, sort of thinking that the West is in decline and that, that things are about to shift in a massive way, I think there was more sentiment like that in China about 10 years ago. After the global economic crisis, after all that happened, I mean, I remember there was a, an interesting sort of shift between about 2008, 2009 and, and about 2012 between, say, the Beijing Olympics and the economic crisis in the world and then the 2012 elections in the U.S. and the rise to power later that year and the following year of Xi Jinping in China. You know, I think that there was a shift towards really thinking that the U.S. was failing, that any day now the whole Western order was going to slide under and that China was ascendant. And I think that sense of confidence in China's own prospects and confidence in the prediction that the West was failing has really diminished since then, interestingly, because I think the outward behavior of China on the world stage has been increasingly assertive and sometimes... uh, a, a, a bit uh, you know, uh, impolite or, or uh, I don't want to say whiny, but but sometimes <laughs> a, a, a bit petulant um, and in a way that they weren't before. Um, but I think internally the confidence is, is, is diminished. I think there's a lot more fear now in China about internal stability, about the uh, sustainability of any kind of economic growth model uh, in China. And I think increasingly there's a recognition that the U.S., the West, the international institutions that they're trying to reshape are not going to be so easily reshaped. They're not going to just fade away. They're not going to break as quickly or as easily as had been predicted in some quarter. But I think that differs perhaps from the consensus in Iran or Russia right now. So just focusing for a moment on China's internal political situation, 
obviously, I think this year is a big year for President Xi because he, you know, he he's hoping to be re-elected as General Secretary during the 20th National Congress. I assume that that the lack of a speedy, glorious Russian victory in Ukraine complicates this for Xi in a way that the opposite wouldn't have done. I mean, presumably now he, he is having to think, I've got all these domestic problems, which, which it would be interesting to hear how bad you think they are. Plus, I have tiders to a quagmire, potentially. How, how do you think that's going to impact what happens next in China? It doesn't make things easier for him, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think, yes, the, the, the 20th Party Congress that probably should happen in September or October, we don't know exactly when yet. And then, of course, the two meetings of the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Consultative Congress next March are going to confirm Xi Jinping as another term for general secretary, another term for national chairman and head of the government. But I think the issue domestically is around sort of engineering that as well as dealing with an economy that's been slowing pretty pretty sharply over a long time, right? The, the real economic growth model that drove extraordinarily high rates of GDP expansion from about 1994 to about 2008-9 is fundamentally broken and isn't easily reconstituted. And for a long time, China has been kind of groping for something new and not really finding it. And there was attempts to sort of upgrade, go into higher value added industries, do this whole Made in China 2025 initiative, all of these. And and it never really worked to the extent of delivering that kind of sustainably high GDP growth. And without that, it's hard to absorb all the people coming into the labor force. The population's already begun to shrink by most measures. China's aging extremely rapidly because they stuck with a family planning policy about 30 years too long that limited family size really uh, strictly. And so now you have far too few young people, far too many old people. And, you know, this, this overall picture economically is quite dire, I think, over the medium to long term for China, at least potentially quite dire. So they're really worried about all of these things. And then, of course, there's COVID. And COVID that has been... Yeah, I, want, I was going to ask you about that, actually. But I mean, that, that was... I mean, what what is going on? I mean, what is going on with COVID? I mean, I think the issue in China for COVID is that there's a couple of things. China never forced anyone to get vaccinated, which I always thought was funny. You know, if Austria can do it, why can't China um, to compel the elderly to get vaccinated? Um, they haven't. And so there's a a significant number, particularly of elderly people in China who have not taken any vaccine, which is why rates of serious illness and death are, in fact, higher there when cases do break out than we would see here, for example, in the UK or in in other other countries with high vaccination rates. But the other aspect is uh, they kept COVID out so so well or so, so effectively for a long time that there's very little underlying immunity uh, from exposure. And so that combination means that when there are outbreaks, there are likely to be more problems than there might be in a different scenario. But the the biggest thing is that China built this up into a a, a sort of very scary monster for its own population and government by saying that it was, you know, a, a significantly dangerous disease for so long and that the government had to take such draconian measures to protect the people uh, in such a strong and repeated way that people believed this and, you know, that, or at least they were led to believe this and, and believed it enough to not oppose these draconian measures. Now it's really hard to climb down, right? After saying this for two years, it's very hard for the Chinese government to just say, well, don't worry about it now. It's not actually that serious. You know, we can let the cases go up again. You're not going to die. You know, the sorts of things that we would hear here, say, during the Omicron wave, could never be said in China because it would completely destroy the credibility of the state. But given how difficult it is to contain, there's really not much choice. But these lockdowns do cost. There are now about 350 million people, by most estimates I've heard, living under lockdown in China. Goodness. Uh, including cities that constitute something like half or more than half of China's GDP. Wow. Um, are basically locked down. It's not clear if Beijing is going to be locked down. There's a lot of nervous discussion in many quarters about that because there's a significant outbreak going in Beijing right now. 
And so individual housing compounds and neighborhoods are being locked down in Beijing where you sort of suddenly fences go up around them, uh, signs go up saying this area is under lockdown until further notice because of a single case of COVID that happened in this uh, this neighborhood or something like that. That's obviously not good for the people in the neighborhood. It strikes fear and, and nervousness into the people who see it from outside the neighborhood. But so far, the government's been unwilling to say we're going to impose the same kind of lockdown in Beijing that we have in Shanghai. And then that also provokes interesting discussions. So it's really unclear what's going to happen. But I think the zero COVID policy has to stay in place at least until after the two meetings next March, because any risk of a major outbreak or the political consequences of climbing down from taking COVID extraordinarily seriously that would be implied uh, by changing the policy are just too great. So they're going to keep it in place. And add to that also, lockdowns are really advantageous when you've got sensitive political events. The is CCP it, pattern is to lock down whenever yeah. there's a major is it, event. Is it also to do with also with their prestige, though, in the sense that they think they've handled it exceptionally well and they want to continue handling it exceptionally well, but it doesn't it wouldn't look good if they had this massive outbreak, I suppose. I mean, I, Yeah, exactly. It, it would look terrible domestically. And I think handling it well, portraying the way China has been handling it as handling it really well is predicated on that narrative of yeah. saying COVID is a, is a deadly dangerous disease that if we allow it to spread is going to kill thousands and thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, and we have to make sure it doesn't spread at all. Uh, and really minimize the number of people who die from this, even at tremendous cost in other areas of public health, the economy, etc. If you continue to sort of back that narrative, then the Chinese government is doing what it needs to do. And perhaps people should support that within China is the idea. And so to me, the big question is how many people still believe this narrative and how many are questioning it? I have no idea and I have no way of knowing. I suspect even Xi Jinping doesn't know. And if he knew, he might adopt a different policy. I'm just wondering, I mean, we're going a bit more deeply into the how you deal with COVID than, than I think we thought. But it does seem to me that I think sure. what, what the rest of us have all learned is that at some point you have to lift the lockdown and accept that everyone's going to get it. And if you do the vaccination program, then you can you can manage that process. But otherwise, what we're looking at is China essentially closing itself off from the world because every time it opens itself up someone's going to fly in and and infect somebody so this i think bill leads into something that you've been saying quite a while which is that china is closing down and the external messages are finding it more difficult to get in so then what you're getting is as, as with Russia, you, you have a reduction in mutual understanding because social media closes, because you're not allowed to talk about things. And and that's one directional in a way. So do you think after the party congress, things can can change in the other direction again? Or do you think China is heading in one direction? I'm really not sure. Uh, if I knew the answer to that, uh, I could either make a lot of money or garner a lot of power, and, and I have neither. But, uh, you know, I, I think that after the two meetings, the Chinese government will look to reopen, at least for economic exchange and trade and so on. I think it's really very strongly in China's interest to lift lockdown, to reopen, to re-engage, at least in terms of trade, as much as possible to return to kind of the status quo before the pandemic. I don't think that's going to be very easy. I think for the reason you just cited, it's going to be difficult for them to move with any speed in that direction. And they'll have to take a series of very small steps over a very long time or else risk basic credibility domestically for for the same reason of, you know, how can you lift lockdown and allow this virus to spread unchecked when you've spent years and tremendous social and economic costs portraying it as, as horribly dangerous and, and, and backing the need for these incredibly draconian measures. So I, I think they're going to be stuck to some extent without being able to climb down as fast or as fully as they want to. And I think that that will have really strong and negative implications for China's economic strength and health, as well as for its political stability. Can I ask, so I'm going to shift us on because we've been talking quite well already. And there's, there's another major player in the Indo-Pacific, and that's India. And when you were talking earlier, the two of you, about China and Iran, we're sort of drawing these I don't know, parallelograms of, of semi-alliances or um, relationships based on interests. And I think that the Western world has been 
I don't know, surprised is a gentle way of saying it, shocked is a um, probably more accurate way of putting it in most quarters, about the position that India has taken with respect to Ukraine, which has been categorised as strategic ambivalence, but others would say it's not really ambivalent if you're not supporting Ukraine. Um, so so there's, there's a row about that. And it's a row that is, you know, has strongly, strongly held views on, on both sides, um, particularly in India. And clearly, India is trying to calibrate its position vis-a-vis Pakistan, vis-a-vis China, vis-a-vis the West. And, and Russia has, has a part in that calibration for India. I mean, I suppose a nightmare for India would be that you end up with stronger Russian relations with China and Pakistan. So, Bill, how do you see what's happening in Ukraine impacting on India's position in that global order, which includes its relationship with the West and with China? Mm. I mean, I, I do think it's obviously very damaging to India's relationships with Western countries to find itself sort of on the wrong side to, to some extent when it comes to these questions. Um, I think India is forced in some ways not to disown Russia completely, uh, largely because of the degree to which it's reliant on Russia for military equipment. Uh, over a very long time, right? If we go back to the at least the 1960s, uh, India moved closer to Russia in many respects in terms of trade, but particularly in terms of military procurement. And so I don't know, and I'm not an expert on military procurement or hardware, but I don't know to what extent India can totally disengage with Russia and keep its military equipped. Uh, in terms of India and China, that relationship has been terrible uh, for a very mm-hmm. long time, uh, really for 60 years um, and continues to be terrible. Every now and then there's a little bit of a sort of blip of improvement uh, over some kind of trade or, or, or cultural exchange or something like this, but basically that relationship is very bad and almost, I wouldn't say inimical, but not friendly at all, which is one of the reasons why China's relations with Pakistan have always been so good, is that you know both China and Pakistan see a, a good partner in the other because they're both afraid of and worried about India. Uh, and India doesn't like either of them, right? So, so they, they're sort of driven together in that sense by this mutual uh, threat from India. In terms of, therefore, how India would want to play things with Russia, yes, it's important that Russia not be too close to China from India's point of view, I would think. Because if Russia is too close with China, that creates a, a sort of alignment of states against India's interests uh, in, in Asia as a whole. Uh, to a greater extent than it would be comfortable with. I don't think India is too worried about that, that it's going to sort of lose leverage because Russia has always been much closer with with India than with China and probably continues. uh, I'm not sure, actually, if I would say it continues to be so, but uh, I don't think there's a huge threat of that happening. Well, there was a bit in the joint statement, which um, for the benefit of anyone who hasn't read the joint statement, there's another bit where they talk about Um, This sort of alliance between the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative, saying they're going to intensify practical cooperation between the EAEU and China in various areas. And then there's this phrase, promoting greater interconnectedness between Asia Pacific and the Eurasian regions and build the greater Eurasian partnership, which, again, you see that phrasing is essentially, it's, it's your point, Bill, the multipolar point. But also, if I was sitting in India, I'd or Japan, or, or you know, Australia, or you know, you'd think, hmm, where does this leave us in our own region? I mean, it, it's, it's hard. I, mean, I know from China's point of view, what they're trying to advocate with this, which is building of more links in Central Asia, as well as in sort of Southeast Asia and into the Indian Ocean. That's the overall sort of architecture of the One Belt, One Road initiative when it comes to building of economic links, infrastructure and soft power, and in some cases, maybe even hard power uh, in some of these places. How effective that is, I don't know. I mean, I, I... frequently deride or not deride but but sort of minimize uh how much i think this is really uh effective i, I don't think this is a, an overarching great strategy that's, that's proving to be terribly efficacious one example of this you know is building a railway from i believe first it was from Xi'an, then it was from iwu and now they're talking about all the way to hangzhou uh, all the way across asia into europe and to uh, italy or france or something it's not economically viable, according to every analysis I've heard. I mean, the, much of the railway has been built, 
but it isn't really useful for shipping things over such a large distance. It makes much more sense to put something on a ship if it's of high mass and not that high value. Uh, much, much cheaper to do it and more efficient. Much better to put it on an airplane if it's sort of small and low mass and very high value. So the, the, the railway isn't really economically efficient. And then there's this issue with Russia, and this is where the joint statement is potentially interesting. There's long been this issue with Russia over the Central Asia bit of this initiative in that Russia has been very protective of its economic sphere of influence in that region, such that certain countries at some points that have tried to deepen their trading relationships with China have been stopped from doing that or, or had things made more difficult by aspects of their relationships with Russia. And Russia has pushed for different kinds of you know, customs unions and so on with Central Asian states that have made it harder for them to, to develop new links with China. And so this maybe indicates that there is a beginning of a consensus between China and Russia over integrating their spheres of influence in Central Asia, at least economically. But I, I think that may also well be reading too much into this. I doubt very much that we're getting that close to that point. But it seems to be hinting maybe in that direction. So, I mean, what, one of the striking things for me, I suppose, is the way in which the Russia-Iranian relationship has also developed in, in terms of their collaboration in some way over Central Asia since the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, it's it's been quite interesting in the sense that Russia and Iran have clearly been opponents, really, for, for a large period of sort of modern history. But since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been a certain amount of synergy and sort of coincidence of interest in terms of what they want in uh, Central Asia. So one, one of the striking things, I mean, let's go to the Caucasus as well, is that both the Russians and the Iranians have supported Christian Armenia, you know, against Shia Azerbaijan, which is which has been a, a bit of an eye opener for some people. But it's also to do, obviously, with the internal politics of, of each country. And then, of course, since Putin has been in charge, there's been quite a striking relationship, almost a personal relationship, I would say, developed between Putin and Khamenei. And I don't know if um, you know, Bill, but when Putin apparently went to Tehran, he he commented that he saw the spirit of Jesus Christ in the face of Khamenei. You know, obviously the the, the clerical, you know, they love this. You know, it's absolutely marvelous. I, I have to say, Putin hasn't actually denied or affirmed it, but it, it's been repeated so many times, and they've sort of said, "Well, you know, great." So the, the, there's been this really quite interesting relationship. Uh, developed, and I was very struck talking to a number of people, um, you know, who know the the Russian side of things as well about about actually Putin's religiosity. Actually, I hadn't realised Putin is is well, at least he aspires to a certain religiosity. And this Archbishop Kirill is quite an interesting character. I have to say, he probably could have done quite well in Iran, actually. But uh, um, so the, the, there is this tremendous sort of synergy that probably we don't see in the sort of Iran or the or, or the Russia-China relationship. I mean, the Chinese have been much more circumspect in how they voice a number of their uh, their ideas. I suppose they're, they're probably cleverer. But I suppose this crisis, this war in Ukraine, has brought out the worst in Putin's and, and Russian ideology, and a lot of this seems to echo, I think, um, some quite striking comments that come out of Tehran about you know, the decline of the West, I suppose, um, the wickedness, actually. I mean, there's a tremendous shared Anglophobia, actually. I mean, that, that's really quite striking. I mean, it is all really about the British in some ways. Uh, but also, you know, there's, there's this sort of notion that one has to purify one's society, get rid of Western culture, so on and so forth. And fundamentally, I suppose, this notion that the international order is unjust and needs to be reordered, and this is part of the process. There's been I suppose some quite striking comments coming from the Iranian side about what Putin's invasion of Ukraine signifies. For them, it's a much, much larger struggle. It's part of a, a larger struggle against the West. Uh, you know, I wonder in some ways, I mean, Lavrov has said, just to sort of return to you, Bill, in some way, I mean, Lavrov did say at some stage that this is really about reordering the international order. And back to your point, really, I think about multipolarity. We want the West to basically sort of back off. So they all saying things in slightly different ways, but, but I suppose in my view, I mean, I'm sort of wondering how, just how much you know of that synergy exists. And I think you know sometimes there's an echo chamber that, there that yes, we don't see what the Chinese are really saying because they're much more circumspect. But the but the Russians, and the Iranians are doing a very good job at amplifying some of these ideas. You know, maybe if we if we don't see what the Chinese or the Indians are really thinking, uh, 
we can look to the Russians and the Chi- uh, and the Russians and the Iranians, I should say, and and, and see how, what they're expressing, and maybe get a, a little bit of a window into how they uh, into how they operate. But these are, I mean, I'm throwing out these thoughts. I suppose, as you're saying, you know, in many ways, we don't really know how uh, what is at the heart of this. It's 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 just a bit, I suppose, worrying to to see some of this come out. You know, these sort of crisis situations. Hmm. Well, I think what's really interesting with this, what what that brings up in my mind, is this this disconnect again between Chinese thinking about geopolitics and and most consensus in, in the West about geopolitics, in that China really is hoping for a multipolar world, not for its own hegemony, right? So other countries frequently look at China and they say China's trying to build its own hegemony or it wants a bipolar competition with the US, it wants to be the Soviet Union 2.0 kind of thing and, and have, you know, sort of world superpower against other world superpower. Not to say that China is not problematic or is, is wonderful or anything like this, but it doesn't have that intention. It really doesn't. It's not thinking along that line. I don't think that China believes or that a consensus of policymakers or experts in China believes that that's possible for any state. I think they're quick to remind the U.S. even that you know the U.S. is not even really capable of doing that anymore. Like That's not going to be possible for anyone. And that we have to kind of move to this multipolar world. Now, what I wonder, based on what you were saying about the Russian and Iranian discourse around this, and I don't know, but I'd be really curious for your take on this. Do they also think that or are they thinking the West is in decline? It's time for a new ascendance of non-Western power or it's time to constitute a new block against the West in a kind of global bipolar competition? You know, are they, in other words, thinking about hegemony or or Cold War type competition in a way that maybe China isn't? I mean, it, 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 not, it is a, it is very interesting because I think the more uh, sober, you know, commentators in Iran would go for the would lean towards what the Chinese are arguing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the more uh, ideological are actually going for something a little bit more complete. I mean, it goes back to some of the things that Suzanne and I have talked about in previous podcasts. You know, the whole mm-hmm. uh, Khorasan stuff that we were talking about so it, it, it there, there is an el- element there and it, what's very interesting about what you're saying bill in a sense is that you know one wonders whether there are people in beijing sort of thinking yeah i don't know if we want to get too close to some of the ideas that are coming out of tehran and moscow because you know yes you know we we broadly support a certain sort of worldview but we're not really keen on the complete disruption of the international order which you know is certainly something you get from some iranian politicians i'm mean, not all by any stretch of budget but certainly by some some of them in the what we would term the deep state. Oh, I think China's not keen on disruption of the international order at all. Yeah, actually, yeah. They, they want to preserve and and they would phrase it and see it actually enhance the international order, but by reshaping it in yeah. a way that's less about U.S. dominance yeah. and more about a kind of shared governance among a number of different players, uh, including, of course, China, and changing the rules in ways that would be more open to China's pursuit of its own interest. But I think very fundamentally, they don't want the international order to collapse or to be completely broken, although that was China's position in many ways, say, in the 1950s and 60s. You know, I think it really has changed yeah. quite a bit away from that. And the question for China is, can it manage a transition of the international order in this direction or facilitate a transition in that direction rather than can it break or undermine the international order. So I think that is a real difference if, in fact, that represents what the Iranian or or Russian perspective is, that they really just want to smash the order. I think what we could say is the distinction is, is perhaps, I suppose, the Chinese are more interested in reforming it. The the more hardline elements in Russia and, and Iran are thinking about what we often term, you know, creative destruction, you know, it's this idea that we do want a new order, but you really got to sort of break a few eggs to uh, do that. And I presumably the Chinese are less enthusiastic about their omelette. Yes, yeah. I think that's a fair way yeah. of, of characterizing yeah. the difference. On which note? <laughs> which brings, I'm going to, I was going to say mm. on which note, but this brings us back neatly to mm. um, Liz Truss's uh-huh. speech, because she too is talking about needing to reshape the world order I think this is fascinating, and, and that was really fascinating listening to the two of you speak uh, just then, because what it demonstrates is how much the, the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, is not a localised conflict, but it is something that is already having profound implications on how countries across the world think about what the world order is and their place in it is. And as you were saying, but I mean, the, 
what China wanted, a weakened NATO, reduced US credibility, is potentially the opposite of what it's going to get, which is, you know, more more countries joining NATO, America piling into Europe again in a way that few actually would have expected. So, so there's an awful lot of change going on at the moment. And I'm just thinking that it'd be really interesting to watch how China positions itself as the Russian war in Ukraine changes that balance of power. Yeah, again. definitely. And I think, you know, increased involvement of the US and Europe is also not necessarily something China opposes, right? Because increased involvement of the US and Europe may mean that the US is a little less focused on Asia and the Pacific, which would be a good thing from China's point of view. So, you know, the, these situations are not as clearly black and white for China as I think it might look. And a weakened NATO may be advantageous for China in some ways, but in some other ways it might not be. And it certainly isn't something China would ever come out and support. Right? They would never say, oh, we want to weaken NATO. But it may be that a weakened NATO benefits China in some respects, but in some other ways it might not. Right? A more robust NATO might actually benefit China's security interest in some other respects that are not as, as yet as clear. If, for example, it means that there's more investment into Europe from the US and less into Asia, or that there's more sort of uh, stability in Europe politically rather than, than conflict that might actually benefit China in some way. Or it might mean the emergence of another new pole if Europe actually got its security policy together and formed a coherent pole of international power in this multipolar world. Well, Bill, thank you so much for that that fascinating tour de force. I have to say, I mean, it's obviously this is a discussion that's going to continue, and I hope you will come back and we can continue and extend the discussion further, depending on how things develop, of course. It's been fascinating for me, certainly, to see all these connections going on, uh, these sort of transnational and international connections. That I mean, I've said to some people that, you know, sometimes we do see the world too much in these sort of categories, you know, separate the Middle East and the Far East and, the, you know, Europe and so on and so forth. But it's it's quite interesting to see how they're, they're all interconnected and there are uh, wheels within wheels. So thank you once again. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to a revisiting this topic with you, Bill, uh, when hopefully everything will work smoothly. Uh, that's, a, that's an in-joke of listeners between myself, Suzanne and Bill. Thanks again. uh, (laughs) Thank you from me. And And from me. See you soon. Goodbye.